So the Gray Zone published this article that I thought was really, really good, as is a lot of the Gray Zone stuff. Um, U.S. sanctions and economic conditions drive Nicaraguan migration while Washington blames repression. So this is a really common tactic of the U.S. Um, you see it all the time with Cuba. We're, I'm going to talk about it in depth here with uh, Venezuela because I'm writing a book on Venezuela and a lot of my research is um, kind of not focused on this, but it, it's touched on this. Um, the the way that the U.S. basically sanctions a country, puts them under a siege, um, does everything they can to destroy their economy. And then when people leave, um, especially when people leave to the U.S., which is what always happens when a country is being colonized, is a lot of people migrate to the country colonizing them. Um, the U.S. blames it on socialism. They blame it on the Sandinistas. They blame it on Ortega. Um despite the fact that the Sandinistas and socialism in Nicaragua has been, you know, combating poverty, creating these systems of rural welfare for the sort of peasant populations in, in Nicaragua, making sure they have health care and things like this. Um, so, and of course the U S is keeping incredibly stringent sanctions on Nicaragua as they do with any country that tries to move towards socialism or, or even democracy. Um, so, Um, so what I wanted to talk about mostly was the way that this is being done in Venezuela and how it's, you know, some of the stuff that I found with my research. If you want to know more about Nicaragua specifically, definitely check out this article. Um, and I imagine some of the same tactics that they've done in Venezuela that I'm talking about in the book are some of the same things they've done in Nicaragua. But in Venezuela, well, not in Venezuela, but in like Colombia, which borders Venezuela or Peru or Brazil or um, any other country in Latin America, the U.S. sets up these migrant settlement programs, migrant settlement programs, which, you know, they portray as like charity, USAID and all these other arms of the U.S. State Department are like, we're doing charity. Look, we're helping to settle migrants. We're helping to get migrants in these countries jobs and, you know, giving them money to get settled. But what it essentially amounts to is a bribe for people to leave Venezuela. You know, they'll especially have these migrant um, settlement programs targeted at engineers, targeted at skilled labor, skilled workers who are necessary um, to keeping the actual productive economy going, uh, keeping the production of goods and services that Venezuelan people rely on to survive. Um, those workers who are necessary in that process, these migrant settlement programs, funded by USAID will basically bribe them to leave, you know, come settle in Colombia and you'll have this job with a Western multinational making more money than you would in Venezuela. Um, and then of course, billionaires can donate to this, you know, Oh, I donated to migrant settlement programs. Aren't I a good person? Um, get it as a tax write off or whatever else. And what they're really doing is, is trying to do old school siege tactics on Venezuela. Um, starve them out with sanctions while getting all their skilled workers or productive workers to leave the country. Um, so as I said, they've been doing these migrant settlement programs in Colombia as well as Peru um, and Brazil. So we were kind of talking um, earlier in a TikTok that I uploaded to YouTube, like the U.S. has so many NGOs and so many arms of finance capital like banks and whatever else all around the world in Latin America or whatever. That as soon as the U.S., uh, or I mean, as soon as they start moving towards a more democratic system of governance, as soon as they start moving towards socialism, it's almost like imperialism happens automatically. Like these, these arms of the U.S. empire, these NGOs getting money from the NED, uh, these apparatuses that serve Western finance capital, these banking apparatuses immediately, you know, start dumping funding, uh, funding into the opposition. Um, parties that are pro-U.S. start increasing um, political organization of those parties on the ground. You know, USAID and these NGOs can kick up the amount of migrant settlement programs that they're doing in surrounding countries to try and lure skilled workers out of um, whatever country is trying to move towards socialism. Um, so there's basically this, I, I mean, I think it shows that imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism, right? Imperialism is an inaction. 
imperialism wasn't the Iraq war. The Iraq war was an, a horrific act of imperialism. You know, one of the worst that we've seen in the last 20 years, along with Libya and Syria. Um, but imperialism was the oil companies who were reliant on Iraqi oil. The oil companies who snapped into action when Saddam Hussein started trying to adjust oil quotas um, in a way that would be beneficial to Iraq. Right. The the ruling class of of industrial and finance capitalists are reliant their profits are reliant their surplus value is reliant on exploiting other countries super exploiting other countries right that is the system that's in place so when other countries start trying to change the system it hurts the profits it hurts the surplus value of these finance capitalists and they immediately snap into action and they have so much infrastructure set up you know, the arms of finance capital reach so thoroughly all over the world, as do NGOs and the NED and um, all these arms of uh, U.S. imperialism are, are already set up all around the world. So when the banks are angry, when the banks on Wall Street in London, you know, who kind of centrally control the empire um, are angry, these arms of finance capital and the NGOs that serve them can snap into action immediately immediately without even really thinking about it um which i did a TikTok on that which i will play for you now all right how about let me know in the chat a lot of the recent u.s backed color revolution and coup efforts in recent years is that the u.s has so many ngos non-governmental organizations set up in other countries as well as arms of western finance capital like banks and they controlled the IMF and World Bank, whose daily actions have a huge effect on the global economy. So when a left-wing socialistic leader takes power like Pedro Castillo in Peru, it's almost like imperialism starts happening automatically. Finance capitalists and oligarchs will almost instantly increase political spending, and the NGOs kick their political organizing into high gear, usually getting some money from the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, which is basically a private version of the CIA. So in a lot of countries, the U.S. has the political infrastructure set up to start destabilizing them immediately. It shows us how imperialism is not an action, it's not a verb, it's the stage of capitalism that we live in, the global system. What I've noticed... I'm sorry I had that video muted right away. Y'all didn't even get to hear the juice world. I still see the IMF in my room. Can't forgive the loans that they gave you. I thought that was a good joke. I probably should have just said that in the video instead of that's what the caption is. But either way, <laughs> that's a TikTok basically saying um, what I meant there, like the imperialism is a global system. So the infrastructure for overthrowing other countries and doing regime change is already set up and snaps into action. Somebody said that they feel like this is what's going on in Peru right now. Oh, thank you for the super chat. Um or sorry, this is what's happening in Brazil right now. And they saw an article about it. Definitely. Definitely. This is another great example. Um, headlines like this really underline the fact that capitalism is the en enemy of democracy. It's from Alan McLeod of Minpress News. And it's a Reuters article. Um, Brazil markets fall after Lula takes office vowing to end poverty. So immediately because, a, a so and this happens anytime a socialist or left-wing um, democratic pro-working class leader is elected, um, it affects the markets. The markets react, meaning capital reacts. <laughs> it reacts as, oh, they're going to end poverty. Ending poverty isn't good for us. Um, and they snap into action and, and do whatever they can to um, starve out Brazil or whatever country is moving towards um, ending poverty. But this proves, you know, that the the system itself that we all live in is structured so that if a, a leader is by, for, and of the people and wants to fight for the people's economic interests, the most powerful people in the system um, are against it and they have the power to immediately snap into action and try and put an end to it, try and put an end to the will of the people actually being carried out, um, which is hilarious because, you know, the U.S. and all these other liberal democracies claim to be um, based on freedom, democracy, liberty, all these things that they can't can't live up to. Mm -hmm.